Good morning. I'm Brian Curtis. And I'm Doug Krisner. Here are the stories we're following today. Fed Governor Chris Waller says that policymakers can't afford to proceed carefully with interest rate increases. Here's Waller speaking with CNBC. There's nothing that is saying we need to do anything imminent anytime soon, so we can just sit there, wait for the data, see if things continue. The biggest thing is just inflation. We got two good reports in a row. Can wait and see what a third one looks like and see whether this low inflation is a trend or it was just an outlier or a fluke. Fed Governor Chris Waller on CNBC. Separately, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester said that the Fed may need to raise interest rates a bit higher. However, she thinks there is still time before the next Fed decision. Fed officials will gather next on September 19th and 20th. We had uh, the price of crude oil rally, not just here in New York, uh, but uh, the Brent contract as well. This was after Saudi Arabia and Russia said they'd extend production cuts as these countries try to offset weak global demand in new york crude oil was up 1.3 percent we closed let's see uh 86.69 the barrel that's the highest level since about mid-november of last year and in turn that boosted many of the energy stocks here's jim bianco of bianco research since late june crude oil prices are up more than 27 percent right now uh gasoline prices haven't caught up with it and they probably will when you see a big move like that and yes i know the saudis have been voluntarily cutting they've extended their cuts but those have been in place for months it's more consistent with a strong atlanta fed gdp and strong data in downgrading the probabilities of a recession because people are consuming energy because the economy is moving forward I think that that will continue to be the case. That is Jim Bianco there of Bianco Research. By the way, this rise in the price of oil will likely cause more displeasure for consumers in the U.S. The Biden administration is trying to avoid the threat of $4 a gallon gasoline. Now, gasoline prices are already at their highest seasonal level in more than a decade. Brian? And this one is interesting, a big IPO, but perhaps a little disappointing. SoftBank's Arm Holdings is planning to raise at least $4.87 billion in an initial public offering, and we hear it's aiming for a valuation of close to $55 billion. It would be the biggest stock debut of the year, but not nearly as big as was initially expected. We get more here from Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Previously, we believed that Arm wanted to raise between eight and ten billion dollars at a much higher valuation, say sixty to seventy billion dollars. But what happened or transpired was SoftBank acquired the twenty-five percent stake of Arm that the Vision Fund held, and we know that all told, after the transaction, SoftBank will still control ninety percent of the shares, uh, which is an interesting dynamic given the kind of big-name cornerstone or anchor investors that are on this deal, which include Apple, Nvidia. AMD, Alphabet, Intel, among others that Bloomberg's reported. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Arm said in a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission that he will offer 95.5 million American depository shares for 47 to $51 each. Well, the Chinese property developer Country Garden has avoided its first default. It did so by paying interest on $2 bonds within a grace period ending September 5th and 6th. Now, this did bring a little bit of relief during a liquidity crisis, which has shaken China's financial markets. Here's Bloomberg's Rebecca Chung-Wilkins in Hong Kong. So they have rustled up this $22.5 million, they say, and they have told note holders in order to avoid uh, an official default, they've made that payment within the grace period. But Country Garden, even just this year, has to raise another just over half a billion U.S. dollars to pay off at least four bond uh, maturities and another coupon that comes due this month. So we're certainly not over the sort of will they, won't they excitement that we've seen all through the last 30 days of this grace period. That is Rebecca Chung Wilkins. By the way, so far this year, shares in Country Garden are down about 62 percent. Brian? Meantime, China, Doug, is said to be looking to raise funds to bankroll investments in chip making and research. Bloomberg's Joanne Wong with the story in Hong Kong. 
The China Integrated Circuit Industry Investment Fund is establishing its third and largest investment pool of about $41.1 billion. Reuters reported that the process may take time and is unclear who the potential investors are or when it might launch. But the country's finance ministry may contribute about $8.2 billion to the fund. Despite local media enthusiasm, it remains unclear how Chinese players can circumvent strict U.S. curbs on technology. Shares in chip-related firms were mostly down on Tuesday in the wake of weak economic data. In Hong Kong, Joanne Wong, Bloomberg Radio. Doug, we're seeing a lot of coordinated action now on the property sector in China, and it, and it appears to be coming from the, from the top. Country Garden, we just did that story. They made the interest payments on $2 bonds uh, within the grace period. It's not clear if they got help from the state on that. that. We might learn more about that coming up. But mortgage and down payment rules have been relaxed. The banks have been told to lower rates. One key question, and we can, we can uh, put this to our guest today, is it too late? Uh, that's something be. that yeah, that's something that we just don't know at the moment, but it might be. Well, obviously, this is going to buy Country Garden a lot of time. I think the company's got to sort through about $187 billion U.S. worth of liabilities. The other thing that I want to point out very quickly, Brian, is that the Fed so far has offloaded about a trillion dollars from its bond holdings. We reached a record in April of last year, about eight. Point four trillion. So right now, I think the balance sheet works out to around seven point four trillion, and all of that roll off has been happening without too much in the way of market disruption. Absolutely, that seems to be quiet, uh, quietly happening. That's something else we can talk to our guests about, Doug. Uh, let's take a look now at global news. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has added a bit of nationalism to the G20. Ed Baxter has global news from the 960 Newsroom in San Francisco. Ed. Yeah, we're not even reading between the lines here, Brian. Uh, dinner invitations have replaced the word India with ancient Sanskrit word Bharat. Bharat is used interchangeably with India in the Constitution, often appears in popular songs and movies. In recent months, Modi's party has begun using the Sanskrit version, and it's included now on the dinner invitations for the G20. A careful eye on U.S. President Joe Biden's health after his wife Jill tested positive for COVID this week. White House spokeswoman and Karina Jean-Pierre here. The First Lady is experiencing mild symptoms and will remain in Delaware for the week. President Biden tested negative last night for COVID-19 and tested negative again today. He's not experiencing any symptoms. So the president will leave this week. White House National Advisor Jake Sullivan says the trip is still on. On Thursday, the president will travel to New Delhi, India to attend the G20 Leaders Summit. On Friday, President Biden will participate in a bilateral meeting with Prime Minister Modi of the Republic of India. And on Saturday and Sunday, the president will participate in the official sessions of the G20 summit. Now, Sullivan says the U.S. remains committed to working with emerging markets, and the G20 will show the world's powers can work together even in challenging times. As for China, well, President Xi Jinping, as we've been reporting, will not be there. So Sullivan says nothing China related is scheduled at this point. Nothing's been scheduled, uh, but the president has said before that he's looking forward to picking up the conversation that he had with President Xi in Bali last year, and he fully intends to do that in the months ahead. Yeah, formal G20 sessions are this weekend. After two freezing incidents in the past two months, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell returned to the Senate floor today. Bloomberg's Nancy Lyons has more from Washington, D.C. I'm glad to uh... Welcome our colleagues back. Senator McConnell made no reference to his health, but did say there's plenty to do in the coming weeks. This month, of course, <clears throat> Congress needs to address our nation's most pressing needs with timely appropriations, and we need to keep the lights on from October 1st. While McConnell did not reference his health, his colleague Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer did. I'm glad to see him back and doing well. In Washington, Nancy Lyons, Bloomberg Radio. Now, uh, the job one is keeping the government open. Right wing of the Republican Party in the House might try to make that very difficult. Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson says they'll be calling what they what they call a minibus, a shaved down version of the budget introduced this week. McConnell and Schumer have both said that spending bills in the Senate at least always pass on a bipartisan basis, that you always get both sides to agree to keep the government going, and that these votes, the minibus, might be a signal to House Republicans to get this done 
keep the government running, keep all those checks coming for senior citizens and veterans and all those people, um, keep planes in the air, all that sort of stuff. Meanwhile, U.S. congressional doctor says Senate Republican leader McConnell shows no evidence of seizure disorder or stroke. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries in San Francisco. I'm Ed Baxter, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. I'm Brian Curtis, along with Rashad Salama, Doug Krisner on markets, and Ed looking at news for us. Let's get to our guest, Eric Lynch, Chief Investment Officer at Sharf Investments. Eric, let me ask you about what might be a mild contradiction in capital markets. As Doug mentioned earlier, we have companies just rushing now to lock in borrowing costs. Uh, before central banks can raise rates further. And yet you have companies like BlackRock and and PIMCO betting now uh, with real money that the Fed's tightening cycle is ending. Uh, Which is it? Which one is right? Or is that just the market doing what it does? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a great conundrum, isn't it? I like how you outline that. I think the question comes down to what is more important with the Fed's uh, the Fed's two mandate going forward. Is it inflationary pressures or is it full employment? You know, if you consider the fact that um, you know the the current administration still has a low approval ranking, uh, it's pretty telling. It means that there's a lot of uh, citizens in the United States that are being impacted more by their wallet than they are by the increases of asset prices. So what that tells us, and kind of what you can kind of read between the lines of Powell following the last meeting, is that they're still heavily focused on what inflationary pricing is doing to consumers. And I I think there's still going to be a bias towards tightening that uh, even further, at least keeping a hawkish stance. And so what that tells us is that, you know, rates may be higher for longer. Well, absolutely. And Eric, when you look at uh, what's going on with the you know, bond buying at the moment, it's pretty much bifurcated. On the one hand, you have asset managers and long-term players actually buying bonds, and uh, you've got the hedges out there shorting them. So there you go. That tells you everything. Which side would you be on? Yeah, I think there's still room to be hawkish here. I mean, let, let's, let's look at the ground level for a second, get out of the clouds. Dollar General reported last week, it's a bellwether for the low-income consumer uh, but it's a very large demographic, unfortunately, in the United States. They had negative same source sales on the quarter, despite nominal increase of the prices, right? Uh, that's not great. And because they had to bring markdowns even to get consumer traffic, the, uh, the gross margin, the operating margins declined. Annual kind of year over year earnings per share actually declined by 28%. And so that's just another indicator, indication that the consumer in the U.S. is hurting. And the Fed's going to maintain a hawkish stance. It's interesting that in your notes you say that non-U.S. stocks are more attractive than than U.S. stocks at the moment. So where would you be focusing? Yeah, well, I would kind of preface it by saying we think there's more opportunities outside of the U.S. You know, I'm sitting here in Los Gatos, California, domicile of Netflix, Silicon Valley. It's kind of blasphemous to whisper this, but we do think that there's not a scarcity of growth and profit growth. There are opportunities outside of mega cap U.S. tech. And so uh, specifically, we think outside the U.S., there are opportunities and let's call it revenge spend still as the economy can kind of consumption transitions from goods to services. Things like UK based Smith and Nephew are recovering quite nicely from the, uh, the pent up demand of elective orthopedic surgeries. And things like Heineken in the Netherlands are going to still continue to recover from the on-trade uh, consumption of, of alcohol. So both of those things, just to put in perspective, uh, we think are going to produce earnings growth at 24 of about 15 to 17 percent. That's versus consensus S&P growth for 12. And these are only priced at 14 to 15 times earnings versus the S&P price around 19. And so that's a good opportunity of these multinationals that have some revenue exposure to the U.S., but they're just treated very differently because they're domiciled out outside of it. Yeah. What about Chinese companies themselves? Would you be interested in them? I know you uh, talk about Baidu, and certainly you can, you've already talked about people who would be proxies for China uh, in the roundabout way there. But uh, tell us about uh, where you see value, if at all, in terms of uh, the Middle Kingdom. Yeah, it's a great question. There's a lot of regulatory and now economic risk, as you just outlined before in the property market. You know, what we've seen in 
prior bubbles, if you want to call it that, we'll see if it is, um, as markets deflate and there's an epicenter, whether it's tech in 2000 in the United States or it's a savings and loan crisis, uh, what have you, if you get away from the epicenter, obviously you're improving your probability of perhaps making good risk adjusted returns. And so as it relates to China, you know, we all, we do think it's kind of, a, uh, an interesting fact that the market doesn't seem to be penalizing a lot of U.S. big cap companies with Chinese exposure, like mm-hmm. Apple very much, but Baidu remains very, very cheap. So yeah. Baidu looks yeah. really cheap, 20% earnings growth price of 14 times. Mm. Eric, thank you. Eric Lynch, Chief Investment Officer of Sharf Investments. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, your morning brief on the stories making news from Hong Kong to Singapore and Wall Street. Look for us on your podcast feed every day on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcast. You can also listen live each day on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices, Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM Channel 119, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Brian Curtis. And I'm Doug Krisner. Join us again tomorrow for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia.